Um, hello, uh, so I'm uh, Scal, yeah, as you know, uh, Google, and uh, this is Jai working with me. So actually, it's going to be a, a dual. We got it. Yes. So it's, it's going to be a dual presentation. Um, so we thought we'd be doing a very long uh, and very boring uh, presentation about all the, the stuff uh, that got finalized in everyone. Uh, but yeah, it would be very long, and there's going to be a, a talk uh, coming soon with all the gory details. Um, so instead of what we'll be just maybe picking up some uh, very recent finalized tools that maybe you didn't get an update on and try to kind of settle the score with this. Uh, so we just picked four of these and uh, we're just going to go into the details, some technical, fairly technical details. And, uh, yeah, the real boring uh, presentation is going to be in, uh, at IC, the conference, uh, in three weeks or in China. I think. I don't know. Yeah, we, we have it. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe try you can. Sure, yeah, I can, I can just get started. So thanks everyone for having us. Um, I think the well, first thing we just wanted to mention is obviously uh, Tim, where he is, I can't find him right. There you go. Uh, Tim did a great talk last year uh, and covered a lot. And we actually, I know, had a discussion about trying to cover everything in the 15 minutes and realized that his 45 minutes last year did a lot of that. So definitely encourage you to take a look at the talk if you missed it last year. It's been a while since you looked at it. Um, what we're really trying to cover is like more of the Delta of some of the big tools. Um, so we we did five of them. Uh, the first one, I don't know if you want to start with the uh, motion estimation. Yeah, this, this one is the, is the crazy one, I think. Uh, so this is something new. We uh, we can teach the, the collocated macro block uh, motion vector from uh, VP9, and we introduce something that I think is crazy in uh, AV1, uh, which is called motion field estimation. So you know what we do usually we, when we have a macro block. We look at our collocated macro block in a reference frame, and we get a motion vector. We say, okay, we're going to try this vector in the Canada at least because this should be okay if, the, if the, the, uh, the motion is pretty much smooth and parallel. We're using the motion vector in the same place from the uh, reference frame. It's going to work. The uh, problem is, it doesn't work when you have a lot of uh, cross motion and very fast motion, uh, an object moving over a slowly panning uh, background. So when you have this cross motion, uh, you can see. The black trajectory very smooth, so this one will, will work well with the collocated macro. And then you have the, the red trajectory crossing there, and it doesn't work. You, yeah, you cannot estimate, for, and it's kind of uh, annoying because it happens a lot of time in, in the movies. So what we did is like, okay, <coughs> uh, we're gonna we're gonna look at the reference frame, and we're gonna trace back the motion vector from this reference frame. And so you see, this one is the reference frame, and it goes back to the past reference frame, and we're trying to, uh, to, uh, and, uh, to find the motion vector for this current frame. So we just linearly interpolate and find the collocated macro block. And we do that for all the reference frames. And we, we just like, record all the motion fields from the current frame. And when we get that, we kind of uh, have some, uh, some, um, some the motion vector to, to use uh, for the current frame. And it's a lot of work because you have to go through all the reference frame in the future and trace back the motion vector and try to see if some of these motion vector intersect the current block. Um, so this is a lot of work, but eventually we managed to, uh, to have this in the, in the spec. And uh, we just restrained uh, the, the, the search space to only 64 pixels and 32 pixels. But still, it's still a lot of work to do. But yet, with, uh, using that, we can just find the best interpolated uh, motion vector from the future reference frame. Which is pretty nice, but it's a lot of work. That's <coughs> partially, uh, uh, it's going to be alleviated with the hardware, but uh, still a lot of work to do. But it, work, it works pretty well. So yeah, this one is pretty, pretty useful. It's a bit crazy. Uh, so the second one that we wanted to talk about was a forward keyframe, um, which is really just sort of an opportunity within uh, within a GOP to uh, actually encode the final frame of the GOP at the beginning. Uh, and treat that as sort of a golden frame that would then uh, be referenced as a displayable frame at the very end of that. Um, and this is something that I think we've been playing around with for a little while, and there was a challenge around how to handle uh, the, the carryover of some of the reference frames into the following gap, right? Because the benefit was supposed to be um, you could sort of have doubled up to uh, near two sort of consecutive uh, keyframes or standalone frames that could then be referenced in, in future, future gaps. Uh, but the, the standard design, I think, was just to reset all of your reference uh, each time you went to a new GOP, and that was causing problems. It sort of undermined the whole benefit. So we actually added a flag uh, in order to be able to determine whether or not you were going to refresh your, um, your reference frames or not between each GOP. Um, and so there was an option then to sort of decide when to use this feature and when not, when to take the additional overhead and not. 
Um, and so th this actually proved to be pretty beneficial. The, the reason we mentioned it here is we, we were actually seeing close to like 4%, I guess, gains um, just from this. So obviously that's a preliminary results. I'm sure as we, and like all things, as we dig into it, we'll probably uncover new issues with that. But right now it looks like that's pretty promising even as built. And we continue to do some more experimentation to modify uh, the actual size of cops or the positioning of the keyframes, things like that, to maybe make this more efficient. But I think anyone who's, who's building encoder work um, you can certainly dig into this yourselves and try to see if you uh, can cover anything with that. Uh, yeah, so the level map, uh, the level map of it. So this one is not, uh, it's not very uh, exotic. It's just like to settle the score because there's been a lot of variation on the, how you kind of code the coefficients, uh, the residual coefficients. So this one is kind of final decision we made. Um, so the encoding process for all the residual is now, as such, uh, we, we start, you, you can follow the, the coding process here from the, from the top. So we, we start with coding the end of block uh, position. So it's kind of, a, we use the regular prefix and extra bits with, with a lot of context, of course. Um, so we start with the end of block, the EOB. And then the novelty, I think, which is uh, pretty nice, is that we, we trace the, the non-zero coefficient backward in zigzag order. We start from the EOB and we make our way back to the DC coefficient. And we code the, the coefficient that are less than 15. Okay, so that's the, the first bucket of coefficients to the small one. And then the, <coughs> it's helpful to, to go in backward uh, scan order because then we have a lot of uh, context and, uh, to predict from. So we use like five contexts. You can see it on, uh, on the top right here. We, we use up to five contexts to, uh, to predict the, the value uh, of, the, of the level, which is kind of uh, pretty efficient, actually. And that's one advantage of going backward in zigzag order. And when we're done, then we go <coughs> We go forward and we, we cut the signs and also the, the very big uh, levels that we used. So yeah, uh, that's the final uh, design we used after a uh, lot of iteration. I think it's pretty nice and it's pretty efficient. All right, so then one more that's maybe a little more fit for the, the handling of film grain. Um, so we actually had a few options for how we were going to do this. Um, and I think what ultimately ended up happening is we wanted a little more flexibility um, in how we define this in the actual spec. Uh, and so the, the details, the, the quick block diagram here is that um, sort of after denoising stage, some of the information from the denoising that you get from the original signal goes into your film grain estimation process, and that's carried out sort of outside the actual coding <laughs> process um, to then reinstitute uh, a, a newly generated version of that film grain instead of trying to exactly replicate the grain that was in the original picture. Um, and so that way you kind of separate it out from the coding process, make things a lot easier and more efficient for the encoding. Uh, and visually you're not going to notice a big difference because, you know, statistically the, the film grain itself is going to be essentially indistinguishable from what came in. Uh, the, and, and of course the importance of this was, you know, for, for folks like Netflix or sort of the, the, the film studio content folks. Um, that some of the, many of the creators were very insistent that Phil Green did in fact need to be maintained. So this wasn't just something that we wanted to get rid of. It was actually a feature. Uh, and, and the challenge I think with this was, um, you know, every Phil Green generation method uh, was going to lead to some different results, sort of by definition. And so how to handle that from a performance and from a you know bitstream compatibility point of view. And so uh, the, the note we added here is just sort of the conformance point for when this is getting evaluated is after the decoded stage before adding in a film grain again. Uh, and the, the, the approach that uh, the group was taking to what constitutes a uh, compatible approach to film grain is actually uh, fairly loosely defined uh, in the official spec. I think it's something like... Yeah, if you remember from the MPEG-4 uh, time, uh, it's, it's always been a, a, contentious, a contentious point. Like, uh, do we want exact bit, uh, bitwise exactness uh, for the, the grain, the film grain? And uh, so there's been a lot of discussion about that. And eventually we said, look, okay, ish. Uh, right, yeah. So the, I'd say the spec is very loosely defined and then it says something like, is subjectively acceptable or something vague like that. Uh, but the important thing is that uh, folks at YouTube and folks at Netflix did say that as part of their standardization process for hardware, for the wider ecosystem, um, the plan is to have a much more stringent policy. And so I think uh, to anyone who's, who's looking to have compatibility across the ecosystem that gets certified in other hardware, I would recommend looking at what we end up publishing in some of those specs. I think it's going to be much more useful and much more constrained. 
uh, than what's in the original spec. So just a heads up, I, I, you can imagine the discussion that went into that, um, but that's where we landed. So that, that's the update there. Uh, and then one last point just on sort of extended tile. Um, I don't want to go too much into this, frankly, because I, I don't think we'd be able to necessarily cover the exact details of this in a short amount of time. Uh, but more just a heads up for folks who are doing um, sort of VR work, 360 work, um, work that covers, yeah, exactly, light fields. Um, it's just what's going on. Yeah, and, exactly, and I think the intention here was just um, you're able to handle individual uh, sort of tile and individual blocks from within a frame, uh, all as sort of reference points for a, a subsequent frame. And the way we handled that was by grouping these, um, these tile lists in order to uh, define where those references are coming from. And the, the, the note here is just that the tile lists each sort of refer to a different frame. Um, and so when you're, when you're handling the tile lists, that's the approach that we took um, in terms of how that, how that would work. Um, and so what you're seeing sort of on the left there is just the, the encoding process, like sort of where the references are coming. And on the right, you're seeing how the, the tile frame ends up being then turned back to YUV in order to be uh, used in the encoder. So just a, a very brief mention for that. Um, obviously, worth, worth looking into the spec into, uh, into our documentation for more detail. Uh, but that's, that's something to keep an eye out for if that's the area you work in. So with that, I mean, I think we just wanted to wrap up with just a couple mentions about where things are coming from the Google side. Obviously, there's a bunch of companies rolling out lots of things. I think there's good stuff coming later in the talks today. Uh, but the, the update from us was just, uh, you know, now that the spec is frozen, we're starting to roll out across our product areas. Uh, the demo performance in, in Chrome and YouTube is sort of available in, in the beta builds, respectively. So you can go to test two uh, and opt into the AV1 experiment at sort of the resolution of your choice. Uh, by sort of our standard approach is to work at uh, SD for uh, AV1 for now while we sort of get some data on how that performs. Uh, so just to set expectations accordingly for this audience, uh, you know, if you if you try run try to run a 4K encode uh, and play it back in Chrome, it will be interesting to see what happens to your machine. Uh, but that said, I mean, we we do want to get it out there. We do want to make it available, uh, and and we're obviously improving that as much as, as fast as we can. Uh, so that's something that you can look forward to now, the, the full rollout sort of into stable builds, into production uh, across the board by default would be later this year. Uh, next year is where we're thinking about trying to do a lot of the work for WebRTC, uh, as well as the Android support and software. So Android Q is where we're targeting to have a software decoder available. Uh, and then for hardware, we're looking at 2020 is the earliest we've heard from folks for when they actually think they'll have hardware available. It's mostly TVs and a couple of mobile SOCs, um, some of the uh, very widely dispersed mobile SOCs are talking about 2021, so you kind of look at both of those. Um, and then the last thing we just wanted to close on, um, this is something you can just look at later, a bunch of links for you, and that last item, um, actually, sorry, we'll add it to the, the official version of the slides, I think it's missing on here, but there's actually a talk next month in China um, where one of our engineers who actually did a lot more of the actual work on AV1 is doing full tool list talk. So if you did want to hear everything from start to finish um, and, and try to learn all of AV1 in 45 minutes, that would be the talk. We'll try to publicize some of those materials as well. And of course, we're still around, so if you want to discuss AV1 things, just come see us. If you're not fed up AV1. <laughs> exactly. Awesome. Thanks so much. Right. Thanks. Appreciate it. Hi, thank you for uh, the presentation. Uh, AV1 is out, and that's great, but now what's next? Uh, do you keep on working on new tools for the next codec? Um, how are we going to have a date um, on AV1? Is there going to be an AV1.1, uh, AV2, or whatever? Because the industry is uh, you know, also running with uh, NPEG BBC. Sure, yeah, I, I can take that. I mean, I would say, uh, I, I don't think there's been any official decision or really substantive discussion about that within the AOM group overall. Um, so I don't, I don't think there's an official announcement coming anytime soon as far as I know. Um, that said, I think every company is kind of aware of what you're talking about, the fact that there's you know, always more work to be done and more investigation to do. Certainly our team has been continuing to work on, on the coding tools and you know, always kind of keeps churning out, churning out research. Um, we have s taken some of the folks who were 
I'd say 100% on AV1 earlier this year and had them both focus on you know, the encoding and decoding optimization part of this, as well as in some cases taking some of the benefits and taking it back to VP9. Um, so we, we do consider VP9 to be in many ways a codec that, for the web that gets used today, so we use it a lot. Um, and so there's there's some distribution of work there, but it's not like we've, we've shut down the research side of things, so. Yeah, there's two types of research actually. You know, some tools you need for AV1 are going to go into AV2. And the, the folks that are uh, starting to work on pure research stuff, um, some of them are interested in machine learning to get the, the logistics. As you know, the, the search space is growing a lot, the complexity of the encoder. And so people are looking into uh, cutting through the search space using uh, machine learning. And this will be applied both to AV1 and AV2 for the next one. So this kind of the direction is going to be but, uh, yeah. I think for everyone it's done. Right, it's yes. Not yes, everyone is done. Yeah. Not <laughs> one, it's, not sure. it's going to be a Right. 